Okay, um, just a little bit about myself, my background. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, I'm from Miami University, where I completed my undergraduate degree in marketing and sports studies. And I also continued my education at Miami University by completing a master's in sports studies as well, where I, uh, through that I got an interest in gender, sport, and media. So that kind of is where this research kind of developed from, is from my master's thesis. So as you can see, this title here is the Sport and New Media Complex. And I'm going to be describing to you guys the contested terrain of gender and sport news blogs. And before we get started, it's pretty important to understand that internet usage in America has increased dramatically to having over 260 million users across America and involving 76% of the population. And as a result, the term new media has emerged to describe the variety of internet-based resources such as websites, blogs, podcasts, online video, fantasy sports, video games, and so on. And currently, sport fans are spending over 13 hours a week online viewing sport content, which I think is a little bit on the low side, to say the least. And also, the internet has bypassed newspapers and television as a leading source for how sport fans gather information surrounding sport. And more specifically, the blogs are becoming increasingly utilized to gather this information, as this is seen as Deadspin, which is the country's most popular sports blog. In 2005, when it first came out, there were over 600 million page views in Deadspin alone. Just kind of shows you the power and influence of the growing area of sport blogs. And given this nature of how fans are gathering information in new ways, we need to go from transitioning from traditional media representations surrounding women's sport to how that translates over to new media representations surrounding gender and sport. And in order to understand this, I used a uh, theoretical framework that combined traditional media research and new media research as well. And more specifically, I focused on Stuart Hall's encoding decoding model, which was a sharp contrast in 1980 from how pre previous traditional media research was focused on. That previous research kind of viewed fans as just consuming sport text in like one singular meaning, and that was it. But Hall's encoding decoding model, however, emerged and described a rather complex relationship where messages are encoded into text by producers, and then the readers decode those messages in unique ways, kind of depending on their pr uh, different circumstances they're involved with and so on. However, it's also important to recognize, as Hall points out, that dominant ideologies still maintain power and influence, despite the ability of readers to interpret messages in unique ways. Additionally, it's also important to interpret sport media texts within a highly commercialized context, as this is described by Sut Jolly's Sport Media Complex, which describes the interdependence of sport media to work together to have um, increased audiences and to um, increase popularity of sport, while also increasing popularity for media outlets as well. So you have this relationship where they're both kind of working off of each other. And as a result of the increased commercialization within sport, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to blur the lines between commercialization and sport. It's becoming so commercially powerful and involved that you can't talk about sport necessarily without talking about the commercialization of it. Additionally, I also looked at new media and blog scholarship to give myself a background and basis on how to interpret these texts as well. And in order to understand the traditional media themes, I found four prominent themes throughout the research. First is underrepresentation of women's sport. This is found through a variety of research has found that women's sport is underrepresent, un underrepresented compared to male sport. And in 2009, for example, women's sport was covered in only 14% of USA Today articles, 11% of New York Times articles, and 1% of coverage on SportsCenter within 2009. Additionally, the theme of women athletes is inferior has also emerged, where female athletes are often trivialized and marginalized through uh, representations that often trivialize their power, strength, and ability as female athletes and marginalizing their accomplishments. 
And additionally, the theme of heteros heterosexualization and sexualization of female athletes emerges through blatant sexualized jokes and advertising campaigns that often emphasize the physical attractiveness of female athletes. And lastly, the theme of homophobia and fear among fear of uh, lesbian athletes also emerges as lesbian athletes are often ignored within traditional media representations and in order to deal with that media representations often over, over feminize female athletes in order to combat this fear of lesbian athletes through having athletes appear in feminine clothes makeup kind of like a hyper feminized version of a female athlete. And they've also included representations that include a strong presence of husbands, fathers, and male coaches to kind of reinforce the heterosexuality of female athletes. In order to um, get an understanding of the sports blogosphere and how gender kind of translates into that, I focused on three blogs in particular, Deadspin, Women Talk Sports, and Women, Women's Hoops blog. And within this, I focus primarily on how the WNBA is presented and how it's discussed throughout these three blogs. And it was within a three-year period from 2008 to 2010 in which I analyzed through a narrative analysis 30 blog entries on Deadspin, 33 blog entries on Women Talk Sports, and 36 within Women, Women's Hoops blog. And by analyzing this, I focused on the blog entries themselves and also the discussion that occurred through discussion board comments by readers as well. And within Deadspin, the underrepresentation of female athletes is perpetuated as well as there is only within the three year period 30 blog entries. I'm sorry, within thir within three year period only thir 30 blog entries surrounding women's sport. And they also focus on atypical controversies with the women's sport. So they're not actually covering women's sport in terms of actually what's going on within the field, but focusing on kind of off-field kind of controversies and things that take place. And there's various examples of reference to women's athletes as inferior, including a kind of mockery and portrayal of Cynthia Fowles dunk within the 2009 WNBA All-Star Game. What I thought was very interesting, they even managed to view women athletes as inferior within post-game fights. So as you can see, um, there's a post-game fight involving Deanna Jackson of Chicago Sky and blog author, which you guys will find here I find very interesting. Blog authors have anonymous nature, so they make up their screen names. So you see a variety of unique screen names throughout my presentation. So we have MJ Deadspin, which described the contest as you see there as slow, boring, but fundamentally sound. So obviously this is problematic because it marginalizes women's sport and it encourages and celebrates the fact that there's violence among females. And what I also found through the analysis of Deadspin is discussion boards operate as a site for resistance and negotiation. As some of you are familiar with, there's a recent sponsorship deal among the Phoenix Mercury and LifeLock, where the jerseys of the Phoenix Mercury actually had the LifeLock logo on there. And it's kind of like a bit of a controversy within the sport media world, as some people kind of viewed it as WNBA kind of selling out, kind of doing what they can to survive, while they somehow ignore numerous sports, such as NASCAR, soccer in Europe, a variety of sports that have corporate logos embedded throughout their uniforms in virtually every place possible. And as blog author David Cohen frames the story, he frames it as the dead spin is doing anything cannot go under. Yet the discussion board comments emerge as a place for resistance and negotiation. As there's comments that you can see there from Fans Attic that says that this is, you know, an interesting area, more teams should probably do this in the future. And then the, there also is kind of like a mediating force that the discussion board operates. As you have resistance and negotiating, negotiations around women's sport, then you also have kind of the same reinforcements of women athletes as inferior, as seen by Brewski's Brewski's comment here. And additionally, Deadspin suggests that 
blog authors frame and spin a story to justify negative perceptions around women's sport. One story that they focused on I thought was very interesting is they get a lot of emphasis to a WNBA game that was moved from a different venue because of a scheduling conflict with Sesame Street Live. And as you can see, the uh, description there from David Cohen kind of making light of the situation as far as, you know, look, this is what the WNBA has to deal with. This is kind of the reality that women's sports are allegedly boiled down to. But also what I thought was interesting is that while Deadspin does have a lot of anti-feminist views within the blog, there are options and there are also moments where they do engage in critical discussions around gender and sport that is significant. As you see this comment here by Tommy Craggs that addresses the concerns of the WNBA age requirement, being 22 years old, this came up within the past few years as Epiphany Prince of Rutgers left Rutgers when she was 21 to play basketball in Europe for a year so she can go through and prepare herself more and play professional basketball until she's 22 when she come back to the States. Kind of something similar to what Brandon Jennings did within the NBA. And additionally, another example of how credit's given women's sport, but only in moderation, as Candace Parker's impressive WNBA de debut is discussed. As you see here by this comment by Kogod, gives pretty high regard to uh, Parker's efforts in her debut game for the Los Angeles Sparks. However, Kogod kind of catches herself or herself in the moment and says, as you can see there, holy shit, did I just write a WNBA post? Uh, dick joke. So you can kind of see that they are kind of potentially giving opportunities for female athletes to experience a recognition of their success and abilities, but yet at the same time they're kind of conforming to the traditional media representations of female athletes as inferior. And then you also have a comment here that's from a discussion board response from a fan. In regards to sexualization, heterosexualization of female athletes, there's also a story that referred to Candace Parker breastfeeding before a game she had. And obviously this is not really necessarily a sexualization of Candace Parker, but this kind of reinforced her being heterosexual and kind of taking away from her accomplishments as a female athlete by focusing on such an event as this. And what I noticed through this as well is a lot of the blog authorship did not necessarily focus on homophobia and fear of lesbian athletes, but a lot of this emerged through discussion board comments. As you can see through here, virtually any kind of WNBA story was not free from these type of comments. Even a discussion throughout the, surrounding the 2008 WNBA collective bargaining agreement became an event for them to bring up a fear and homophobia surrounding female athletes. Additionally, even a discussion surrounding LifeLock sponsorship at the Phoenix Mercury somehow managed to be an area where discussion board comments that was appropriate to engage in homophobic and information such as that. However, what I want to emphasize through this analysis of Deadspin is people kind of view something, a blog as this, as anti-feminist, but there is definitely a situation where there are elements of resistance and negotiation taking place as well. It's not necessarily a strict anti-feminist blog. And this is kind of evident through a critical discussion surrounding homophobia, as this is in reference to the um, Washington Mystics owner speaking out against the Kiss Cam being involved in the Washington Mystics game. The owner came out and said that they don't feel that it's appropriate because you have kids there and they don't want to be kind of viewed seeing, you know, lesbians ki lesbians kiss on a Kiss Cam. Yet you do have a blog author, David Cohen, who kind of brings up the fact that, you know, why, why is this such an issue? And this is definitely in sharp contrast to women talk sports and women's hoops blogs. Obviously, it's a sharp contrast because there's a high representation starting women's sport. It's often discussed in a more positive way, which focuses on the 
skills and abilities of female athletes as opposed to off-court controversies and stories such as Deadspin did. And in terms of sexualization and heterosexualization of female athletes, what I thought was very interesting is it provides a, a very unique opportunity to engage in critical discussions surrounding this topic. For example, in 2009, Candace Parker had an appearance in ESPN the magazine. And throughout the article, it was very um, sexualized in the way they spoke about her. As you can see here through the comment, through the quote from ESPN the magazine, which is in extreme focus on her appearance as a, phys as a female athlete, not really any engaged in any discussion surrounding her skill and ability. Then you have the response from Q McCall, which is a blog author with the Women Talk Sports, who kind of views it as a point to kind of engage in a critical discussion surrounding the sexualization of female athletes. However, despite these opportunities to engage in critical discussions, you do have opportunities where this kind of becomes reaffirmed and reestablished through women's sports as well. And this took place through a comment by, through a blog authorship by Jane Schoenberger, in which she paid a lot of attention to the draft day choices of WNBA athletes during the 2009 WNBA draft, kind of reaffirming the fact that female athletes need to be, need to be careful of what they wear, need to be presentable in a uh, very attractive manner. And like I mentioned before, these blogs also provide a unique opportunity to engage in critical discussions surrounding traditional media themes. And this is also viewed through the homophobia and fear of lesbian athletes. As Pat Griffin, who posted a, some comments regarding the elimination of the Kiss Cam in Washington Mystics games, as you can see up there, what her comments were. So in sum, what the sport new media complex provides is unique opportunities that occur, but yet you still have the traditional influence of traditional media. And kind of the main point I want to put across here is the traditional media still maintains influence. As blogs, they're just blog authors developing stories on their own, they're often in reference to traditional media sources. Throughout the analysis, there's countless stories that referenced New York Times articles, Chicago, Chicago Tribune articles, Los Angeles Times, Arizona Republic articles. So they're taking information from traditional media. And they might be adding a couple sentences of their kind of analysis and take on it, but yet they're still kind of reaffirming traditional media. So obviously you're going to have the continued emphasis on traditional media outlets through a convergence. And what I also thought was very interesting as well is the marriage of sport, media, and commerce also continues. As Deadspin generates annually approximately $400,000 per year in advertising revenue. As I mentioned before, Deadspin kind of markets and perpetuates traditional media themes surrounding gender and sport as a way to kind of reaffirm female athletes as perceived being inferior and a variety of those other themes as well. And what I also thought was very interesting is Hall's encoding decoding model has basically been turned upside down, figuratively and literally. Through his model, you have an encoding of messages and then eventual decoding of messages by the audiences. Here it has a circular effect where the, the audience is able to make messages themselves, kind of form a circular approach to this understanding of sport media context. And um, as I mentioned before, the meaning is heavily negotiated with the discussion board comments. This is definitely an area that we need to kind of focus in as sports scholars is the fact that while there is this kind of emphasis on traditional media representation surrounding women's sport, there's opportunities for resistance and negotiation as well. And what I thought was also very interesting is it's also interesting to understand that all this is occurring within an unedited nature of sport media context and portrayals. So you have people that are 
writing stories in anonymous nature, in anonymous nature, they're not really giving their full names, their full description of themselves, and they're engaging in very blatant and homophobic references to female athletes. It's not. It, it's go, it goes from traditional media representations that kind of hint at those kind of assertions to more blatant, homophobic, unedited nature of comments. And despite that, Women Talk Sports, Women Hoops blog provides an opportunity to challenge these dominant notions surrounding women's sport, which are prevalent with the traditional media outlets.